without any further ado, give us a, a nice warm welcome for Chris Schilling, everyone. So, uh, Chris, you've got quite a, uh, an exciting background. Can you tell us a little bit about your take on it uh, for those of you that, that haven't uh, read your bio yet? Let's start at birth. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> no, I just realized something actually like, so I don't know, is anybody watching like the World Cup right now? Uh, it's fantastic. I'm sporting my Mexico jersey. I know they're they're out now, but like, you know, they're I, I bought the jersey, so I need some more like opportunities to wear it. So I just want to support Mexico, even though they're out of the World Cup. But I'm also wearing a Canadian tuxedo, so <laughs> it's like I'm an American sandwich. I got like Mexico, American, and then Canadian tuxedo. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, but your question <laughs> wasn't about my fashion. It was. Um, a little bit about me, man. So I am an Oklahoma native, born and raised in Yukon, Oklahoma. I already met a few folks who were uh, Mustang Broncos, so we were very much like rivals growing up. And um, let's say, like, my I come from a, a great household. My mom is one of the strongest people I know. My dad is one of uh, a generation of four uh, generations of blacksmiths. So uh, if you ever drive around Oklahoma City, you see some wrought iron gates. There's a huge chance that uh, iron masters installed those. And uh, when I was a kid, I learned how to dig holes and weld and paint stuff. And uh, I don't do any of that anymore, so it's kind of sad. Um, but yeah, man, I've, I, I lived in Oklahoma, grew up here, went to OU. Learned about entrepreneurship uh, through the Center for Creation of Economic Wealth, which is a part of the Price College of Business, and um, studied psychology, studied architecture. None of that was really related to business. But through it, I was able to have internships like CCEW, where we were actually able to do things like found um, pharmaceutical companies. You know, We started a company that actually exists to this day called Nantiox. Uh, basically, prevention, age, uh, prevention for age-related blindness, like cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration. And through that process and working at OU, I was able to work with other biotech startups primarily and understand, you know, get excited about uh, the startup eco, uh, ecosystem, and more importantly, learn about how commerce can actually shape, uh, can shape policy. Commerce can shape belief. Commerce can shape a lot of different things. And um, after that, I. Uh, worked as the press secretary at the University of Oklahoma for a year, and um, primarily that was just learning and growing and working with President Warren, which is amazing, one of our state's great leaders, obviously former president of the University of Oklahoma. And I stuck around for a couple reasons. Most notably, my wife hadn't graduated yet from college, so waiting for that to happen. Uh, and I can tell you the story about how we met at some point, but that's not, again, that's not what this is about. But. Um, I love my wife, she's great. Uh, so then <laughs> I applied to a program uh, through CCW. I learned that business was my passion. I wanted to be involved in it for a while. So I went to, uh, and I'm, I'm just kind of free, free, you know, free, freestyling yeah. here. So just stop me if I Freestyle. need to go deep into any one uh, concept here. But I uh, applied uh, and got into Harvard Business School. And uh, I'm definitely not HBS material, but it all worked out. Um, the dean of the College of Business, I got to give a shout out for Daniel Pullen. Um, I, when, I, when I graduated OU, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I wasn't sure how I was going to succeed. Um, but thanks to him and thanks to opportunities at OU, I learned about a program called 2 plus 2. Basically, it was a program where you work for two years, and then you go to school at Harvard for two years. And I had thought about it, and I thought maybe that would be a great opportunity. And I told Daniel about it. He wasn't Dean Pullen at the time. He was uh, Vice President Pullen. And, uh, and he supported me. And you know, we, so after that, he said he would write my letter of recommendation. Months went on. We started our pharmaceutical company business. We uh, applied to business plan competitions. We actually got to travel to uh, Las Vegas to participate in a few competitions. And we did well. And um, and the summer started encroaching in, and this is the summer before my senior year. And uh, I went and did an internship. And I went to DC, and I was learning, I was living, and I was kind of forgetting about that, that HBS application. And uh, Dean Pullen calls me about a week before it was due. And he said, hey, just want to check in. I wrote your letter of recommendation. Where are we on this thing? And I said, you know what? I." Uh, that's, I'm glad you called. I don't think I'm ready for this yet. I don't think I'm ready. 
I don't think I know anything about business. I mean, I was studying psychology, I was studying architecture, I was studying Spanish. Like, none of those are really business related professions. And uh, I was like, maybe I just need to work really hard for a couple years and then something cool will happen. Then maybe I'll apply. He said some things that uh, a, a, a dean probably shouldn't say. He used some curse words that I wouldn't recommend or nor would I repeat. Uh, but he called me some names and said, you know, basically, you old so-and-so, uh, the odds of getting in are 0% if you don't apply. And I, uh, I thought about it a lot. And, um, and he basically told me I had to, because he spent the time and energy to, to write the letter of recommendation. So I spent the next you know, five straight days studying nonstop for the GMAT. You know, I'd already been studying a little bit, but I got serious. Submitted the application, and uh, by the end of the summer, had an interview, and um, the, the rest is history. So if there's one takeaway from tonight, it's the odds of getting what you want are 0% if you don't try. And, uh, and from that, that really changed my life. That gave me an opportunity to choose to work at the university, to choose to work with uh, Dean Pullen and uh, the Office of uh, Technology Development, and um, stick around, get married, and then move to Boston, and uh, the rest was history. So I left Oklahoma thinking I would never come back, and, um, and, but there was a great opportunity at a, the Stevenson Cancer Center, which is just down the street from here. It's Oklahoma's only National Cancer Institute designated facility. And um, I can go into detail about that, but I spent a few years there really just building up a team of young, hungry innovators, people who want to you know, build out a brand for the institution, people who believe in the business model, who want to serve patients from all 77 counties and beyond in the state of Oklahoma. And it was fun. And then um, I realized they're better at their job than I am. I, they don't need a boss anymore. They can run this thing. So, I moved on, and I'd always been in, interested in startup. You know, I'd always been interested in creating something out of nothing, and uh, almost as like a motif throughout this entire experience was creating a, a company. And um, I worked with I worked with uh, an individual named Kelly Tran from Appable. Uh, we built uh, one of the first ever university-based mobile applications when we were in school together. Uh, it's called OU to Go, and if you saw it now, you'd think it would be like the worst app ever. But in 2007, it was pretty cool. It was actually one of the first university-based apps ever made. And we formed a friendship that has really lasted until today. And as I realized her talent, she realized mine, we kept a long-term friendship. So wherever I went, uh, she went with me and, and innovation went with me. So at HBS, that, that manifested itself in a couple of different ways. Everyone was trying to build the next Birchbox or uh, you know high-tech app. And I could always tell them, I have a friend who can build that for you. She can do it cheaply, she can do it faster, and she can do it better than anyone else. And she had been doing this all over the country, right? But she, she decided she wanted to start her own company, and we got to help raise funds for that. So when I left the cancer center, I dove in and helped you know, raise money, raise excitement, kind of develop a business plan for, um, for Appable. And um, yeah, and then through that, I mean, I, 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 I don't know how detailed we want to get again, but like, you had uh, some experience at Configurate too, right? Yeah, so Appable is a company, when we founded Appable, we really wanted it to do a couple things. We wanted to build a platform company um, that built MVPs better than anyone else. So uh, some of that meant working with entrepreneurs who had ideas that needed to be turned into MVP, MVPs, minimum viable products. Sometimes that meant building our own minimum viable products. And one of those things was called Configurate. Um, configurate sounds kind of silly, but at the end of the day, it was, you know, you've been to an airport and you've seen those happy, sad faces. How was your experience? Customer data was being collected in the early 2000s through things like Amazon, uh, online retailers, but uh, customer experience and customer feedback at the point of service really hadn't until recently been implemented in airports, healthcare centers, retail, hospitality. And uh, we saw a little bit of an opportunity to ask a few targeted questions to customers throughout their customer journey, whether it was at a hospital or, or, or an airport, gather that data and help managers and administrators make better decisions, reduce costs, and better serve their customers. Um, and that's effectively what uh, I've been doing the last 365 days um, until about May, whenever uh, I, left, I left Configurate. So tell us what you're working on now. Yeah, so um, everything happens for a reason. I, I could tell you how 
you know, me being in this chair is a function of a series of really good people who really believed in me, who gave me opportunities to do things that I couldn't previously do without, uh, without them telling me that. And, um, and, and in this case, it's no different. When I I've been working with Kelly and with Appable for, feels like a decade, but um, at the end of the day, we, we went last summer, almost a year ago today, I was in Vietnam because we were opening our Vietnam campus. And, um, and the Vietnam campus was a big celebration. We were bringing in investors. We were bringing in uh, potential people that we could work with and collaborate with. And uh, we were bringing in advisors. And one of those advisors uh, was named Hamza Hummer. He's actually sitting over there. And um, so we, we met on the mean streets of Saigon. And um, we really bonded. And uh, at the end of our, my trip there, you know, he took me to the airport. We stopped at McDonald's on the way. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. Uh, after a lot of fun, uh, we had uh, a few French fries before we left. But we, were, we decided we're going to work together at some point. We're going to do something together. And we, don't, we didn't know what it was yet, uh, but, but eventually we got there. And this spring, we've been conducting due diligence on a, a cryptocurrency hedge fund. So I've, moved, I've, I've worked with a lot of different startups that I haven't talked about yet. But the evolution of me is I love startups. I love helping people go from nothing to something. And um, I've been hyper interested, academically interested in the cryptocurrency space, uh, the crypto asset space for the last few years. And uh, Homs has been involved in it since 2010. And we realized that with our knowledge, you know, we can, with our knowledge of startups, he has a startup background as well, um, has had multiple successful startups, that we could apply that knowledge towards a funding strategy within the crypto asset space. And uh, we started Ohala Capital. Um, last month. So it's been kind of an exciting adventure so far. That's great. So um, you said that you've worked at a lot of startups beforehand and had your hands in a lot of things. Um, obviously, you know, no startup is a cakewalk. There's probably some challenges that you came across. How did you, what type of challenges did you come across and what type of lessons did you learn and how did you overcome some of those? Yeah, I mean, uh, how much time do we have? I could talk about, about an hour. okay, uh, about 45 minutes. let's talk about startup failures. <laughs> um, startup is hard, you know, most of you have been through at least one iteration of a startup, sometimes two, and you kind of learn as you grow, go, right? Um, I could go chronologically or I could work my way backwards. Appable is an amazing company, it's an Oklahoma based company, but we have a distributed, uh, distributed employer base. Right, so we had folks working in LA, folks working in Philadelphia, and then of course in Vietnam. And uh, something doesn't really work together unless you have a really good process in place. Working remotely is very difficult, and in fact, it's tough to be really successful uh, whenever you know some of your core team members aren't in the same room with you. So, I mean, that was a tough lesson I learned over the last year. Um, Startup by startup, there's a company that we started in 2014 called Vecargo. Uh, Vecargo is a company that was Airbnb for your suitcase. So I'm flying to I'm flying to from Oklahoma City to Saigon, and uh, someone wants something from the U.S. So they order it from Vietnam. I put it in my suitcase and uh, truck it over. To, to, to Vietnam. Basically, that, the idea being that by selling space in my suitcase, I can effectively reduce the cost of travel and make it easier, make it more functional. And on the other hand, there's goods that you, can get, that you can't get in Vietnam that you can get in the US, and vice versa. There's goods that you can get in the US that you can't get in Vietnam. And uh, so we, hypo hypothetically, we were correct. There is a demand for shipping goods, and this network is already taking place. And in 2014, it was a way crazier idea. Now there's actually people you know, trying to, to be successful with it. But we were a little ahead of our time. We were really uncertain about what, you know, what our business model was. We didn't really think about you know, what would TSA think? Uh, what would other federal governments think? You know, what's the <laughs> what do you write on the declaration form? <laughs> How do you, yeah, what do you write on the declaration form? You know, we were getting down to the details of like, I can transport this as long as I don't knowingly know what's inside. And uh, that, that argument doesn't hold up in, in a federal court. Um, uh, we learned the hard way. So, uh, so I mean, we were rife. You know, we were just trying to make it happen. But with Vicargo, it was a failed business. Um, but it was a fun opportunity. And it unlocked an opportunity for us to be long-term successful with Appable because it allowed us to pursue. We actually got accepted to an accelerator on the West Coast. 
And so though, though Vecargo kind of went away, and I think there's still a lot of value in it, but it went away, uh, it brought us to a coast where we could learn from new people, new, new ideas, bring those ideas back in what we think is already a very vibrant startup ecosystem here in Oklahoma City. So you talked a little about, the, about this accelerator that you went through. I know there's people in this room that have gone through an accelerator. What was the vision and kind of business model of Appable before and after the accelerator? Did it change? Did it develop and kind of refine over that? Did it change over outside of that over the years? So we've participated in two different accelerators. One was the Women's Startup Lab in Silicon Valley. The other one was called K Startup. So I went to South Korea last fall and uh, Configurate was a participant in K Startup. So that's a completely different experience. But what I learned from the Women's Startup Lab is that uh, Oklahoma companies can compete, you know? And I think that gave Appable a huge confidence booster because I think when we, if you look at in the investment community in Oklahoma, sometimes you get a lot of no's, and it can be detrimental, and it can kind of set you back a little bit. And in Silicon Valley, what we were learning is we were seeing innovation take place. We were seeing cool new ideas happen. But what we realized is that you know, there's some great people there. There's a lot of innovation. There's, there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of money. Um, but Oklahoma innovators and entrepreneurs can go toe to toe. So I think it really unlocked this possibility of what Appable could become. It extended our vision that we're an Oklahoma company with a Silicon Valley footprint that builds products in Vietnam. And it, it gave us the kind of the confidence to take the big step towards making it a, an MVP company and, uh, and not looking back and trusting that it was going to work out. That's great. So it was a big confidence booster. Huge confidence booster. And also just gives you exposure, right? People talk about Silicon Valley like it's, like it's this nebulous concept. But if you've gone there, you know it's three distinct places. You know, like Oklahoma City, Edmond, and Norman. You have uh, San Francisco, South Bay, and Oakland. You know, Oakland's where the cool kids hang out. SS where the, VC, the annoying VCs hang out. And then uh, all the work gets done in South Bay where, and, and Menlo Park, right? So uh, it's just kind of a different, it's a different vibe. But at the same time, it's, it's geography. That's cool. So uh, you talked a, a little bit about um, some of these companies that you've done and how the vision's evolved a little bit. Is there anything that if you could do it over again, you would change? I'd change a lot. You know, <laughs> I, think, um, I think realizing what you're good at and owning it and being confident in that is really important. Um, one of the things I love doing is connecting the dots. So I love working with startups who have great ideas and are hustlers and are hackers. And I love connecting them to funding resources and uh, you know, bringing something to life by connecting. So knowing that that's what you're, both what you're competent in and that's what, you're, that's what you are passionate about, being able to apply what you, what you know to your business is one, is one lesson. The other lesson I learned is like, I came from, from the Stevenson Cancer Center. It was a great, innovative place. Dozens of PhDs and MDs, but that's not a startup. You know, I mean, it's the the budget was nine figures, right? So, uh, and it was a it was a bureaucracy. So, learning quickly to change my habits, even though I had kind of dipped my toe into different startups throughout uh, my history, changing from working in an intense healthcare environment to uh, a, a more intense startup environment got me, was, was, was shocking. I was not ready for that. It was kind of like diving into cold water and uh, thinking it was, it was warm. And um, so I think being prepared and understanding just how tough startup is, is and how, t how tough it's going to be no matter what um, is, is a lesson that I, I, I try to tell people before they start a business, just like they need to know it's a grind. Hence the name. <laughs> there we go. Was that planned? That was not planned. <laughs> Well, cool. So um, you mentioned a little bit about this uh, crypto project that you're working on now. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I think some of the crowd, if you can speak about it, uh, would like to hear maybe a little bit about some of the exits from your uh, experience in the past. Yeah. So, I mean, we've had uh, Apple has participated, like worked with over 40 different startups, and I think they've had two exits so far. Uh, Configurate's one of those that's that it's, it's kind of left the project unfinished. And, and it's, you know, I, Appleball and I are very close. Like, I love Kelly. She's like my hero. I love, I love how she operates. But at the end of the day, how we make Configurate successful, there was substantial disagreement, right? So really deciding, um, you know, I wanted to pursue the sticky markets like healthcare because healthcare has the highest margins. If you can get into a healthcare system with Configurate, it's awesome. Um, but 
versus retail, where you have to have scale in order to be to monetize. And um, uh, but that being said, there's 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 been a number of different startups who've some of them I can't mention who've had successful exits, uh, but um, but um, what I love doing is I, I love seeing innovators who have a, a novel concepts who have all the right pieces, but lack the funding, lack the support, or lack that one thing that's going to help them be successful, and that's kind of how I've applied myself. Uh, into the equation of the startup. I, I'm, I think the last two folks you've had are technical. I'm definitely not technical, um, but um, I've been able to apply what I do know to uh, the startup ecosystem and, and, and help startups succeed. And, and maybe not any unicorns yet, but the more, the more $10 million exits we can get in Oklahoma City, I think the better. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the crypto projects that you're working on right now. Sure, and I can talk about it at a lot of different levels. Does anybody like know? You guys all know about Bitcoin, right? You guys are smart people. Uh, raise your hand if you like are totally not sold on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. You think it's a little bit of a joke. All right, we got a couple. Uh, raise your hand if you think it's the future and the only future. Okay, we got a couple folks in here. I think there's like a parallel universe. I think a lot of people uh, think of crypto, uh, as Hamza always says, you know, anarchists and libertarians and tech nerds were really invested and interested in blockchain in 20, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. And I think they painted this picture of, you know, the global markets are going to go away and Bitcoin's going to be the standard. And then there's other people who say, you're full of crap or something else, and Bitcoin's going to go to zero and existing markets are going to prevail. And I think the people who look at it that way aren't seeing the big picture. I think that this is a complementary technology. It's, it's, it brings a lot of value, uh, both in, in multiple different formats. I think Bitcoin is a currency. It's a storage of value. Uh, Ethereum is a platform. Uh, it's something that you can build things off of. And then there's distributed apps and tokens that are, you know, we're not super excited about those, but those are kind of the things that uh, where maybe some of the so the people who know less about uh, cryptocurrency see where it could go to zero is because they're looking at people who are trying to make a quick buck through an ICO or something like that. Um, our net view is that New York Stock Exchange is going to exist, NASDAQ is going to exist, investment banks, whether you like them or not, I think are going to exist in the future. And parallel to that universe, there will be a crypto investment space that is going to be um, transformational, but maybe not in the way that people think it's going to be. Cool. So what are you guys doing uh, in that space? So you know our combined knowledge of startup experience. So by the way, Hamza is uh, you know he started a skateboard company and uh, in college, uh, and and then he from that he started uh, a social media company, and then from that he started uh, a company that that was the first company where you could actually make marketing videos, advertisements on Snapchat. And from that, he's done a series of other things. So he's, he's way cooler than me. And he's like super young, and it's unfortunate. I'm like 32 in two days. So, um, but perfect. yeah. But we have, with our experience with startups and our passion for startups, we're kind of applying VC knowledge to a crypto space. And uh, we're looking for, you know, like if you were to look at, like if, if you study like Warren Buffett, he's actually not a big crypto fan. But Warren Buffett looks for companies who have deep moats things that prevent them from, from competition. They look for a good use case. They're looking for a great team and a great technology. And they're looking for uh, high, high user adoption rates. So we're looking for companies and technologies that have the right ingredients to become long-term successful. And we wanna, uh, uh, we we're actually raising money to allocate resources to uh, those, those tech startups. Overall, we think, you know, so I, right now the, uh, the crypto market space uh, is about $274 billion. Um, around December, it was $800 plus billion. And you might ask, was there a bubble? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's been many bubbles over the course of history in crypto. But that doesn't stop the technology from continuing to improve. Once the, once the bubble pops, there's a new norm. So after the last bubbles popped, it, it was Bitcoin was about 300 bucks. Now that this bubble's popped, you know, people disagree, but it could settle between $4,000 and $6,000 per unit. 
But our long-term view is that the value of crypto is going to multiply, and not just multiply, but, but multiply violently. I think that there's new entrants into this space beyond Bitcoin that are going to uh, really, really make it a unique and interesting place to invest your time and energy and your dollars. That's great. So uh, can you unpack a little bit more about the clients that you'll be working with and uh, the type of value that you'll be delivering to them? Yeah, so uh, again, like we're kind of an OTC hedge fund effectively. So what we're doing is we're trying to find people who don't know, uh, institutions who, who, who understand the space, who want to play a part in it, but are looking, you know, they don't want to buy. We look at the crypto space effectively like it's the internet of 1997, right? So you can either own Google, you can invest in Google in 1997 and life is good, or you can invest in pets.com and life isn't so good, right? You, the, if you, most of you weren't born after that, so you don't remember the internet bubble. You were there. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> what, what we do is we're looking for the most innovative, the most exciting tech, the, the technology that has the potential to be long-term lasting, the one that's going to survive the next bubble and the next bubble and the next uh, evolution. Uh, we're doing that. In a, in, a, in a number of different ways, which I can go into detail about. But um, at the end of the day, we're, we're helping people who do maybe like want to have exposure to this space, and we're supporting the technology ecosystem. And in fact, what I've learned is that in Oklahoma City, there's a lot of people who know a lot about crypto and blockchain. So trying to share that story, you know, I thought we were going to have to come in and educate people. But the reality is people seem to already kind of know what's going on. And uh, they've read the books, and they've read the articles, and they have a strong opinion about it, positive or negative. Um, most people seem to like it, though. Yeah, I think if you're probably to go to a, a Google search and type in what does B, it would probably autofill Bitcoin do or what does it mean or how does it work. So uh, exactly, people have a visceral reaction to it um, sometimes before they get to know it, you know. And that's kind of the same way with me. When people meet me, they think, uh, especially in this part of the country, they're like, "This guy went to Harvard." They either like me for no re for you know for no reason. And, or they hate me for some reason, but they haven't gotten to know me yet. And I think that's the same with Bitcoin. We've got to, we got to give this thing a shot, see what's going to happen with it, and, um, you know, and be nice to me. You know? I'm a nice guy. So, and I'm in a lot of debt, by the way. You spent time in, uh, on the West Coast at Nike. You spent time on the East Coast at Harvard Business School. You've spent time in Saigon and Korea and uh, just recently Mexico City and maybe Canada. Uh, <laughs> what keeps you coming back to Oklahoma City? You know, other than your wife in school and your precious little French bulldog, Lenny. Uh, my bulldog is precious. He's uh, he sells cars. So if you ever need a car, I don't know if I should say which brand. It's it's Subaru. But uh, uh, my dog can hook you up. He's got a full time job. You know, and if you're working in my house, if you're in my house, you got to have a job. That's that's the rule. I need to put my dog in contact with yours for maybe some life coaching. I think uh, our chocolate lab could use some of that. Yeah. Uh, so what makes Oklahoma special, man? I love leaving this place, and I love coming back, which, like, you know, sounds kind of crazy. You know, when I take off in an airplane, it's like my problems here are small problems. I can zoom out and say, this, is, this place is, is growing. It's not there yet, but it's on its way. But then as soon as I leave, I think, man, when I leave, I want to come back because I feel like I'm missing out. Because there's people who are innovating and doing cool new things. They're way smarter than me, uh, and, and, and I want to be a part of that. So I think, you know, is Korea, we have to be realistic, right? So are we smaller than most tech environments in, in the country? Yes. I would argue that in a lot of ways we work harder, we work smarter here. Um, but when I go to, you know, I, I love going to Korea, and I, I, I think it's, it's cathartic because you get to see how people live in a different way, how people interact in a different way, how they communicate in a different way, and how they adopt technology. And Korea is a good example because I think that they're, in terms of technology utilization, they're about five, I mean, arguably five to 10 years ahead of us. You know, we're talking about cryptocurrency and crypto assets like they are this new novel thing we're not sure about. And there it's a way of life. You know, people are using, using crypto assets to ride the subway. And they're exchanging, because they're, in Southeast Asia, it's, it's, a, it's an unbanked population. We're heavily banked in the United States, but they're unbanked. So things are different there. Vietnam is, is, is five hour flight away from South Korea, but it's a completely different world. 
It's growing. It's, it's evolving. It's, it's nonstop movement, and it's exciting. Mexico City is a, is a cheap flight from here. I think everybody should go to Mexico City. Um, and you can stay there for a while and just see how the economics of life are different there. People have different struggles and different challenges. But the food is amazing, the people are amazing, and the way they, they engage in life is amazing. So I like to go get taste of different places. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, planning your steak in Oklahoma is, is not a bad idea. Um, there's fantastic people here. Um, there's, it's an emerging economy, um, for, particularly in tech. I think it's a new economy in tech here. And I think that people are doing things here that aren't being done across the country and, uh, or across the, the world. right? So I think it's, we, we all benefit from going to get exposure in different places, but then bringing those experiences back and making this place better and, and trying to connect. That's great. Thanks for sharing. So obviously, you've been in a lot of these different companies. Uh, anyone that's been in at least one startup company or just a company in general has probably had someone say no to them because um, they're trying to push the envelope. They're trying to you know, get sales. They're trying to swing out of their league. How do you handle people saying no? How do you keep pushing through that struggle? What, what is it that really keeps you energized um, and believing in, in whatever you're working on at that time and pushing through that? That's a, that's a tough question. I, I, I would say that you know, the, there's hustle factor that you have to learn to get past the no's. You know, sometimes you know you believe something very deeply and you want it to be successful. And you may have to pivot how that happens. But um, I think you know, when, it's a very difficult question because I think no's are frequent. And you have to be ready for them. You have to be prepared for them. Um, but once you get that first yes, it's like, it's like my man who golfs over here. Like Once you hit the ball for the first time, it's, like, it's a feeling that, that brings you back to golf, even though you're going to have a million missed swings in the future. At least I do, because I'm terrible at golf. Um, so what, what I try to do is mentor innovators, young and old, people who are diving into creating their own venture for the first time, and just let that no be motivation. Let that no, like think about why you got that no. Is it because? they're not ready for you or you're not ready for them is that no because they don't understand what you're talking about or they understand it very well and that they have experience in this space and uh, you can think about all those things but at the same time a no shouldn't shut you down and a lot of people there's innovators here one of my favorites is uh my friend laura from cinderide you know she's been told no for almost a year for it's a non-emergency medical transportation company and it's awesome it's like uber for uh for for non-emergency patients. And that sounds kind of like, why doesn't Uber just do that? Or why doesn't Lyft just do that? It's because Laura has the background, the skill set, the mentality, and the hustle to make it happen. And the, she had commitment from an investment perspective. But a lot of times, those no's got, got, got her, got me down. But, um, but telling her, you have what it takes to be successful. You have the right, the right elements to be successful. Like That's what I love doing. And, and she's persevered. And now she's taken off to, this is going to be the next. You know, People talk about some of the successful Oklahoma tech companies. Cinderite is definitely going to be one of those. And uh, it's because she, she fought through the nose and found the right people to say yes. Her investors are in Oklahoma. Her investors are in Texas. Her investors are on the West Coast. And uh, she's got the right infrastructure and resources to be successful now. But she had to endure a ton of no's to get there. And so just telling them that, it, that they can make it through that is, uh, is really exciting and important. So, and I don't know how f familiar or uh, close you are with being able to explain about some of these seeking investment opportunities, whether in Oklahoma or if you're an Oklahoma company seeking investment outside of Oklahoma. But I know there's uh, folks in the room that are in that same stage where they're looking to, to build investments and they're looking to fundraise. And navigating that space in Oklahoma City can sometimes be tough. Uh, sometimes there's some hidden gems in there. Sometimes people go outside the state. Uh, do you have any experience fundraising in, in the state or outside the state that you can talk about? Yeah, how much time do we have again? Uh, fundra I, I've, I've been told no a lot. And, um, and I feel like I've met, it's a very well-connected fundraising community here. So. You try not to poison the well, even though one person might tell you no. You don't want to say what you think about that person because they might tell all their friends and they might all say no too. <laughs> we have to learn how to invest in startup and OKC, and um, you have to put your money where your mouth is. And again, I'm not a I'm not a billionaire or a millionaire. Maybe one day that'll work out for me, but um, but I have to start putting my money where my mouth is and start saying, even though I'm not a qualified investor, 
I want to invest in the ecosystem because I know a few people in this room are going to be really successful and I want to have a small stake in that game. And, um, and I think the investment community here is learning how to evolve and there's some definitely some great institutions that invest here. But they're investing in, historically they're investing in what they know. If I can build a pipeline from here to here and I can get X th throughput flow of oil, price per barrel, my IRR is going to be X and I'm going to make a ton of money. That's not what the startup ecosystem necessarily wants or needs. I think eventually there's a demand for that, that kind of capital. Uh, but when I talk to friends who uh, have a lot more money than I do, I try to say, you know, you're not playing blackjack, you're playing roulette, and you're playing it over and over again, and you're picking, uh, picking a couple different winners at once, and y you may lose all of these, but you might win one of them, and it's going to be transformational returns. So I guess, you know, if there's one critique I'd have for the investment community here, it'd just be that if you want to be, if you want to say you're involved in tech, if you want to say you're involved in the startup space, you want to invest in that space, be ready for some short-term losses, because at the end of the day, a lot of these concepts, a lot of these startups are, uh, it's not the technology you're investing in, it's the person. You know, you're investing in someone, and maybe my investment in Ben isn't, you know, maybe the first venture is not going to work out. But I like Ben a lot. I think he's a hustler, and I think he's going to be long-term successful. So when he comes back to me with his next idea, I'm going to be all in on it. And I think, by the way, his existing idea is great. Uh, so uh, yeah, <laughs> but the, it's it's just, it's it's an ecosystem of collaboration and working together. And some people have financial resources. Some people have you know uh, connection to financial resources. Some people have non-financial things they can contribute. But I think we all have a role to play to help to help help each other be successful. And, um, and I think that means sitting down with people who have a lot of money, sitting down with people who don't, and teaching them that, that investment in startup is a, is a different ballgame. That's great. Is there anything else that you think that entrepreneurs in Oklahoma City can contribute to the ecosystem or could learn from it? You know, what, what do we need to be doing here? So I kind of like fall into this. I, I, it's almost advice I'd give myself. Um, Sometimes I get discouraged with Oklahoma, and that's just me. I think I'm an introverted person, and I'm not the best networker, and um, and sometimes I just want to go hide, you know. And I want to just work on what I'm working on, and then I want to. It's kind of like, you know, in your second grade science fair project. I just want my parents to be happy. So like, I, or like, or like, I want them to like like my science fair project. So I want to make it really great, and then show them the complete project. I don't want to show them the messy. I don't want to show them the 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 failure and the grit and the grind, like the, the, what I, the concept development, it's, it's just a really messy process when you're in a startup. But um, I find that, especially when I was in it and, and, and still in it, I, I find that sometimes I just want to take and cover up the things that aren't working and only share the things that are working. And, um, and I think we have to be honest with each other in the startup community a little bit more. Uh, I mean, you and I have, have had concept talks and things like that. And I think I've been maybe hyper expository on saying like, I'm failing and here's where I'm failing, can you help me? You seem to know what you're doing. Um, but we just need to be more open with each other and help each other out because sometimes in, in Oklahoma, it's like a resource constrained environment. So I think sometimes I see people perceive, you know, his success as my failure. And we should be looking up to supporting everybody's success, even if it's not mine. You know, him being successful will mean that there might be more startup opportunities, more venture capital opportunities, more angel investment opportunities. And maybe because of his success, he's paving the way for future innovation that I can come in and be successful to. So asking people who've been successful, you know, really working on exposing not just the things that are working, but the things that aren't working, and uh, just help each other out where you can. I think that's the, the best advice I can get. That's great, thanks. And we'll get to uh, uh, about 10 minutes of question and answers if anyone would like to ask something. Um, before we get there, though, any last takeaways? We really appreciate having you on the show. We, uh, it's always nice to kind of switch it up from technical and business-minded individuals. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've been pretty erratic. I don't know how helpful this has been, but I would say that uh, I think getting together to do this is a very important activity. Listening, putting different people in this chair uh, listening to their stories, technical and non-technical. Um, I'm definitely not, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not successful yet in the startup world, but, uh, or what I would call successful, but each failure, you know, leads to a future success and a future new opportunity. So I guess my advice would just be that, 
you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and just keep hustling and, and keep finding people to, to help you succeed. And uh, eventually you'll get there. And uh, I I'm, I'm definitely feel blessed about uh, the life decisions I've made. I loved working for a hospital, but being in startup, being in tech, being around all these cool new ideas and, and opportunities has really given me uh, an opportunity to, to think about myself differently. And um, I just think that uh, it, it, it's, it's a fun place to be. That's great. And, uh, and remind me the name of uh, the company that you're working on now where people can find you. It's called Ojala Capital, and uh, it's O-X-A-L-A. -A. Uh, it's a Spanish word for conviction or hope for, so. Nice. Yeah, or its, der its original derivation is God willing. So God willing, we'll make a lot of money and be able to reinvest in the community. So <laughs> we'll see great. what happens. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks. You guys have any questions for Chris? Yeah, speak up if you can. Yeah, uh, two questions. The first one, if it's, uh, I don't know, if it's trade secrets or whatever, you don't have to ask. Sure. But um, in, this, in this cryptocurrency space, taking investment and giving investment out with so much gray area, how, 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 are, you, how are you navigating that? You're just putting yourself out there and like, hey, we'll take the hit if it comes or? That's a great question. It's a, it's a new world and an uncertain world, and things happen all the time there, right? So the question was, how do you kind of proceed with certainty in the crypto space? And anyone who, I think, who claims to be an expert and has never failed in crypto is not telling the truth. Um, I think you learn by doing, and you kind of see you kind of see pattern recognition. You look at technologies. You can look at a, a white paper, you know, a lot of these cryptos put out white papers and you can see, tell who's copying and pasting from other people and uh, so you just kind of you know 90% you know we argued you know up roughly 80 to 90% of cryptos that exist today won't exist in a, in a in a year or two right so there's a lot of attrition and so you got to be just kind of walking on eggshells right so you got to you got to learn from your investments historically uh, but there is a there's a pipeline of behavior pattern and and we can talk about this offline about you know when we like to start looking at a, at a potential investment and then when we, when we actually invest in it. And it, it kind of follows a set of, of, of patterns and qualities. And, um, but it is, it is also trial by fire. You know, we've learned a lot by buying a lot of terrible crypto assets. Um, and, and again, I can talk about that too. But um, yeah, kind of trial by fire, learn by doing, read a lot. The space evolves every three months. Um, and I would say almost like reinvents itself every three months. And so it just feels like if, if you sleep on it, you kind of miss out on, on what's happening next. And this may be, this is just because you're, you guys are here, but uh, the second question is how do you see uh, cryptocurrency and in, in funding like real estate development? Is, is that something you're going to do or, or you're strictly technology or where do you see that space? So that is uh, crypto and real estate development is a huge opportunity. I mean, I was just talking to folks about where blockchain can be successful. I think healthcare is a huge marketplace. I think uh, uh, we were talking about supply chain development. Supply chain is a, is, a, is a real exciting space. I worked in supply chain when I did my internship at Nike, so I, I'm really excited about that. Real estate's another one, right? I mean, if just think about residential real estate. I am buying a house. I've tried to do this a few times. I keep like fading away. I'm trying to buy a house, but then once I, I'm under contract, then I gotta go, like my real estate agent's gonna take 3%, the other side's taking 3%, so there's an inefficiency there because who decides that 3%? That's, that's not a market-driven number, that's just there. Then I gotta go get, uh, I gotta go get it inspected, I gotta work on title, I gotta do all these, make all these payments, I don't even know what it is I'm doing. And each time I'm, I'm paying a lot of money I didn't previously expect to pay, that's, that builds uncertainty and kind of delays the transaction. But what if you know, a real estate company you know, was able to help automate some of these processes through smart contracting? Um, and I'm, I'm just you know, freewheeling here, so I don't even know if this is applicable or not, but I'm thinking like, what if I can help use a decentralized network to, to, to decouple some of the things that create friction in a transaction in real estate, who, uh, ways to build trust in real estate and actually make the transaction happen more efficiently? Not only can that, that can be exciting in a lot of different ways because I can make the transaction happen uh, more seamlessly, I can make it happen faster, and although I still believe that real estate agents are great and should be involved, maybe the cut's not 6%, maybe it's 3% uh, overall, and maybe you're saving money both for the seller and for the buyer. So I think 
think people look at the cost of uh, the, the cost of doing business, the time cost, the financial cost, and then you can kind of back into some real exciting opportunities, and then and then maybe invest in those over time. Does that make sense? Total sense. Cool. Great question and answer. We've got time for some more questions. What's the biggest mistake that you see the majority of startups fall into? The question he asked is, what's the biggest mistake that a majority of startups fall into? I might ask you this after I try to answer it. Okay. Um, I would say that the art of the start is just difficult. You know, filling out that incorporation paperwork, deciding if you're going to be an LLC or a C Corp, um, really doing some of the stuff that you don't want to do but you kind of have to do when you start a company. I see a lot of people, myself included, that just fell into the I don't know how to do this. I don't know. I don't have the right resources to get started. I don't know who to ask. And um, you might have found a you know product market fit, and you might have have a customer value proposition, but you don't have that operation ability or capacity to get things going. And I think I think I see too many people get going without you know setting the table right. You know, so I think that's that's one of the bigger uh, problems I see, particularly with you know the the startup of one. Yeah. Um, I'd say the easiest way that I can put it is that people try to start building a product before they figure out if anyone actually wants it or not. That's pretty good. Yeah, I think, I think defining, a lot of people say, I want to build something just to solve a problem, but they don't really go out and do the market testing and, and talk to the customer to see if that's something they want to do. Uh, and with Configurate, we learned that hospitals, hospitals aren't startups, but they were going to spend millions of dollars on things that patients didn't ask for. And uh, you talk about like ballooning costs in the healthcare system, right? You know, you really want to make sure that it's, it's a required, necessary, and amplifies the patient experience before you spend money on it. So I think that's a, that's a great one, not just for startups. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly much easier for technologically oriented startups just because the cost of building something is a lot less. Uh, obviously, there are going to there's going to be some, a few hidden gems out there that people can find and, and really capitalize on. Uh, anyone else? Yes, Jonathan. So, <laughs> um, you mentioned a lot about the uh, tech ecosystem uh, differences of other places versus Oklahoma. What cultural limits are is the uh, startup ecosystem you're missing or it needs to work on to get to that next step? Yeah, he was asking about cultural limitations, and I think that's, I think it's all in our heads, man. I think that's really some of the barriers. I think people, some people, I, I've been very fortunate to be able to get out and see what's there, and, and it kind of makes me love this place even more. And uh, I think some people just don't have that confidence that if you can make it here, you can make it other places as well. Um, the spirit of collaboration is just something I say over and over again. Uh, diversity, getting different people in the room, particularly females, and you know, like because that's half our population. So, uh, and females, I've worked with a lot of female innovators, right? And so, getting more of them involved in some of these conversations is important. And uh, I've worked, you know, they've been my bosses, which has been great. I think, um, you know, we have some budding, successful enterprises here. You know, Techlahoma has been great. Um, Starspace 46, what what OU's invested in with the Gene Rainbolt School here. Uh, you know, I2E's made some good investments in the community. So there's a lot of different people who are playing in this space. I just want them to all have pizza parties together. And uh, I want, you know, entrepreneurs to have pizza parties together. I you know, have a sleepover. Let's go work at, you know, go hang out at the skating rink one night. You know, I, I mean, I just think that spending more time together, realizing that we're not, you know, adversaries, we're compliments is important. There's a, the, the, the folks from Tech Ranch in Austin came up here and they talked about uh, how they worked with their funding ecosystem, their accelerator ecosystem, and I just yearned for that. And I just, I, I mean, I'm a connector by nature. I'm a middle child, so I just want everyone to be happy. Um, and, and I don't even know why I just told you guys that, but. I think that's why we get along so well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> middle child. Um, but um, you know, we, we aren't competitors. We are collaborators, and we just need to like spend more time together and and celebrate each other's mutual success and um, find out ways to amplify what we're doing here. Because I think we have the right pieces. Just putting them together is a challenge. We have time for one more question, and then we can meet offline with Chris. If you want to ask any one-on-one -on -one questions. All right. I got a question for you. Just to end it. 
What, what made you want to start Startup Grind? Well, uh, I was... Startup Grind Oklahoma City. Yeah, um, so I was approached by Chris Dillon and Elliot Adams to get something rolling here. My big passion is to make Oklahoma more tech friendly and I see a lot of organizations and events where people talk about a lot of the, as I said earlier, the rose colored lenses and all the great things about it and I really wanted to see something that was a lot more of the nitty gritty and what's the kind of dirty laundry that people don't usually talk about because I think it's very uh, it's very humbling. I think it's very, um, it makes people a lot more relatable. And I think it's important for people to hear that you're going to stumble and you're going to have people say no. And it's important to have that happen because it really, I think, uh, builds a resilient entrepreneur. And, um, you know, this is just one of those small ways that I, I can really give my time and my talents to make something that hopefully provides value for other folks. We should give Alex a round of applause. Isn't he awesome. He just did it. It was a dud this week, but you know, next month it'll be great. I promise. <laughs> no, yeah, you were great. Uh, I, I love the the input, the value. Uh, I know a, a lot of people here were really excited to hear you, and and I think it's safe to say that you delivered on on that. Uh, if anyone would like to ask me any questions afterwards, we're we're good to go here. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks, Chris. One more round of applause for Chris. <laughs>